Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this odd night, Friday evening, for a CAF update, our 22nd. Of course, last night I was doing one of my special interviews, a comic art spotlight with uh, Vincent Cerzolo, which went really well. A little long, went for two hours. Hope everybody enjoyed that. Uh, I know we did a little sales looking, you know, with the auction stuff that they had going on for Monday, but uh, I really was looking forward to the tour of their uh, offices and to get to see a lot of their artwork that they had on the walls and uh, it didn't disappoint. So for those who didn't get to see last night's episode and just were really curious what's on Metropolis Collectibles walls, I would uh, suggest going to about um, you know, maybe an hour and 10 minutes into it. And uh, Vincent kind of shows you all of the work that's on his walls and then he walks around the offices. It's pretty amazing. I had a really good time with, with that. And uh, I hope everybody did too. So a couple of the things that we've got going on right now is uh, so my schedule's just been kind of a mess. Monday we did the uh, interview with Micah, and uh, we had Tuesday off because of Comic Link. So uh, then that's why this little calf update's been pushed to Friday. Now tomorrow, I'm doing a recorded interview with the gentleman who used to own a place called the New York Comic Arts Gallery, and uh, it was in business from '77 to '79. And uh, you know everybody hears about Super Snipe because Super Snipe was the uh, most you know well-known comic shop slash comic art shop back in the day in New York because of uh, George Lucas's involvement with that shop being a kind of a partial you know hidden owner of the business and uh, I know that they did some Star Wars exhibits there so that shop seems to get all of the attention whereas uh, the, the comic arts gallery no one's really even heard of it when I uh, the gentleman who owned it accidentally emailed me through CAF support forms trying to contact another gallery owner about something you know and i read it and i'm like what the heck's comic arts gallery i mean is this a competitor to calf i mean maybe i'll you know i'll google the guy's name and his and this thing and try to figure out who he is and i've you know found some really just vague references to what this was and most of it was from posts on facebook people mentioning that this place existed and uh it was pretty impressive they you know they worked with the studio primarily so they had shows for rights in uh, Jeff Jones, Kaluta, and I don't believe they had a Windsor Smith show, but I know that they sold uh, merchandise for, for Windsor Smith. And uh, they had several other shows over the course of the three years that they were open. And uh, so just in the course of chatting with the guy, I thought, oh, you know, this would be a really cool show to do. And so he's been sending me a lot of photographs and uh, old price lists. And I thought it was really funny because one of the price lists that he sent me today uh, relates really directly to the conversation we had with Vincent last night. I just was going to pull this up. This is a tease because I don't think this thing is going to be ready with all the editing I'll probably have to do to put it all together and make it uh, cohesive because um, we're not doing it live. I'm going to put it together and then probably have it up before the new year. But he sent me this pricing sheet from the Wrightson exhibit and I just thought it was funny that, uh, so this is, I believe, from 78. The cover to Swamp Thing 9 was for $400. And of course, that was on the wall that we saw last evening. And then, then House of Secrets 92, the cover for Swamp Thing, was uh, for sale for seven hundred dollars. I think we could probably easily add uh, two zeros to each of those, and then multiply them by something, and then that would probably be what they're worth today. So uh, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of pricing uh, lists for rights and work, include a work, and uh, I don't believe I've seen anything for Jeff Jones. It's one of the shows that he didn't seem to have a lot of information on. It he didn't even have a flyer for it. So, um, but again, it's going to be a really interesting uh, to talk with them. That. After 79, he just literally got out of the business. So I don't know how closely he followed comics after that time, but he was certainly doing something at the heyday of uh, the late 70s in, in Manhattan. And it's going to make for a fun show, I'm sure. Now on Sunday, this is uh, something else I'm trying. Anthony's been wanting to do something together. And uh, so he was going to be setting up at a show in New Jersey. So I said, uh, I'd be happy to kind of sit in and help moderate him talking with some customers and he's going to be doing a small claim sale. I've been asked what a claim sale is. Basically it's kind of what it sounds like. He's, he's got like 20 pieces of artwork that he set aside from something, uh, some group that he picked up. And uh, during the chat that we have beginning at noon on Sunday, um, so, so, so probably around like 1230, one o'clock, we're going to just pull those images up and he'll tell you what they're, what the price is. And if you want to claim it, you can shoot him an email. You can say claim it in the chat, whatnot. And, uh, you know, you could be the owner of the artwork and worst case scenario, anything that doesn't sell, he's going to be putting it on his website on Monday anyway. So it's just going to be kind of a, you know, kind of a 
Anthony is going to be like your roving reporter at this small New Jersey show. So who knows? It could be totally fun uh, or just a little goofy. But I think at the end of the day, it'll be something to break up the day before football starts on Sunday. Right. So uh, that's what I'm going to be doing on Sunday. Now, outside of that, obviously, you know, I mentioned the other day, uh, you know, the, the sad news of the, of the week, of course, is uh, the announcement of Richard Corbin's passing. And uh, like I mentioned yesterday, Corbin's just was somebody who, who whose work I admired. I didn't I never could really understand it because of the way he was able to draw so masterfully. But um, uh, it's a great loss. And apparently he passed away over a week ago and uh, the announcement was just made yesterday. But um, yeah, a uh, this 2020 really sucks. I'm looking forward to 2021. Like I think most everyone here, uh, it, you know, really is. And uh, Rich Danny's, you mentioned you, you might have that catalog. That would be interesting. I can, uh, cause the materials that he's given me are just like the original stats that he put together. So I'm very curious to see how, uh, uh, you know, all of it comes together cause he's still sending me materials from that, um, from that exhibit. Unfortunately, uh, he's had a lot of photographs taken Bernie's not in any of the ones that he sent me uh, as yet. So uh, my fingers are crossed that he's going to come, come up with something um, because part of the, the Bernie show was done during the month of October. So the culmination of the whole show was this big Halloween party. So you can imagine a Halloween party, 1978 in, uh, in, in uh, mid Midtown. And uh, you know, there's photographs with Al Milgram and uh, I guess uh, so Howard Chaikins in some of the photos Um I think some of Howard's ex-wives are in some of the photos. It's it's rather it's rather interesting, and everybody's dressed pretty crazy for the time. And uh, but yeah, nothing with Bernie. A really old picture of Jeff Jones and uh, Harvey Kurtzman, a few other things like that. So it's again, that's why this I think this conversation is going to be a lot of fun to do, and just to kind of get some insight into the hobby that I don't think is very well known. It's clearly not well known. I didn't even know about it, and I've mentioned it to a few other people, and everybody said you know it's before my time. You know, I, th I asked Albert, hey, you know. You were in the area. Did you know anything about it? And he's like, ah, I didn't start till you know 83, 84. So, so it seems to be prior to most people's uh, experience with uh, you know getting into the hobby. At least for people that I know, I did talk with Joe Jusco, who happened to be going to the uh, uh, a school that was around the corner to it. So he actually had been to it several times. And my fingers are crossed that Joe will actually have some time to just pop in and chat with uh, with Mark and I and. Uh, reminisce because uh, i guess joe bartended for the uh halloween party as a, as one of the things that he did while he was there so yeah again that's why that thing's going to be a little bit interesting uh so because it's an off night and it's a friday i just want to kind of get through the updates that we would normally cover of course this period is from the end of november so november 30th through december 6th and uh, i want to hit on things of course things got sales picked up that week we had thanksgiving in the rear view uh, mirror. And, uh, you know, so we actually had a better week, nothing super fantastic, but at the end of the day, uh, all the sales increased for a total of just over half a million sales between dealers and auction houses. Now, the uh, dealer sales were dominated by uh, a nice sale by Albert Moy. This first piece uh, was a George Perez DC comics presents, uh, interior DPS and it sold for $20,000. Next up is a piece sold by Ramita Man. It's a Neil Adams Tom Palmer Avengers 96 page. It sold for $13,500 as its asking price. Next up is this. This was actually sold as a complete issue by Felix. It's Nick Klein. It's uh, Thor issue number nine. This is not the day you'd want to meet Thor. And next up is this Ross Andrew Amazing Spider-Man number 142 page. It sold for $12,500 as well. Sold by Glenn Brunswick of Panel Page Art. This is uh, another piece by, sold by Ramita Man. It's uh, Bob Layton and Greg LaRoche. And it's a Marvel team of number 145 cover. Sold for $12,000. And Ramita Man again. $9,200 for this winter Hellboy special number one cover from 2015. It sold for $9,200. And so dealers for the week sold uh, around two, almost $250,000 uh, from the dealers that we track. That was up from $168,000 during the Thanksgiving week. And Felix 
definitely dominated sales. He had a lot of commission re requests that were fulfilled that week. So his sales were around $72,000 with Hermita Man coming in second at $58,000. So uh, much better week and uh, just early sales tracking that I've been doing. It looks like it's a little bit of an uptick again this week as well. So certainly um, on the auction house side, which we're going to talk about next, I've, uh, you know, I track a lot of eBay sales as they happen because eBay kind of commissions me when I refer sales to them. And uh, I don't know what's going on, but this has been a really busy week for some reason. And I don't think it's just like holiday shopping because for me, I don't really drive holiday sales. So I'll be curious to see how the original art sales are for eBay next week, just because sales seem really good this week. Um, but for last week, the uh, auction house sales were at $294,000 and the week before that, they were at 281. So there wasn't a huge change from one week to the next. Uh, this is a, uh, it's like I said, 294,000 in sales. This is from eBay. This is a Wendy Peeney Elf sketch, uh, Elf Quest sketch. It sold for $3,250. Uh, next up is, uh, you know, unfortunately has a watermark uh, by the artist who owned the work, John Zelensnik. But uh, this is a Frank Miller sketch from a convention that was sold for $2,750. And uh, finally, this, uh, on eBay was this Jack Kirby, Steve Kid Ditko, Mort Meskin, Captain 3D piece, and it sold for $2,701. And uh, for the three heritage pieces that we picked out, let's see here. This is a Sergio Aragones, Grew the Wanderer, number 46. This was for the complete book, with, so 24 pages in total. It sold for $15,600. And then next up is this uh, piece by Milton Kniff. It's a Dragon Lady meets Joan Crawford. It was a piece that uh, Kniff did for Joan Crawford and uh, handed it over to her at her birthday and it sold for $7,200. And the last piece is this Doug Wildly Martian Chronicles strip from the early 1970s, sold for $6,000. And uh, let's see, Rich Danny's uh, says the catalog came out uh, comic size, yes, New, yes, New York Comic Arts Gallery, October 19th, oh, so it was 77. See, that was the one thing I haven't been able to clarify with uh, with Mark, was was it 77 or 78? I know the gallery opened in 77, um, but he was never very specific. He's, you know, he's a bit older now, so he, he, everything's a little sketchy, and it's funny, of course, all the flyers that are out there, and he has copies of all the flyers, none of them put the year on it. They all just have, you know, it's uh, the exhibits October 1st through the 31st, nothing had a year on it. So it was a bit weird. Uh, and w William wanted to know, did I bid on the uh, Rolling Stones splash? You know what? I actually did not. I forgot and came back to it the next day. It sold for about what I expected. I think it was 279 uh, biddings uh, started at 150. I you know, probably should have. You know, my sweet spot is still definitely, if I were to get any pages, you know, that I would really, really want, it would be from issues one through four. Um, just because I think the, the artwork's a lot tighter. So, um, but that piece I was very interested in because it, it, you know, it, I, I collected probably the first dozen issues or so. So that 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 particular one was was uh, one that I would have wouldn't have wouldn't have minded picking up. But uh, definitely the ones that I'd really like to get are those first four issues, uh, interior pages from those. Um, so, but thank you, Rich, for that information on the catalog because um, I. I don't think he has it. He's he's he basically statted everything together. It's funny. It's you've seen old like old paste stuffs and stuff. That's literally what this guy did. He pretty much did everything on a typewriter and paint and cut all the pieces out, glued them down, and ran out and printed them in mass quantities. And so it was pretty uh pretty sketchy, you know, considering how the, all the people that he's working with in the comics business that you know the things he was putting together weren't very uh, technically superior to anything going on at the time. Um, but he's very proud of his marketing because, you know, apparently he had to do a lot of just putting posters on the wall, uh, you know, all around where his, his place was. And he said he traveled up and down Manhattan promoting his shows that way. And uh, yeah, that, that's good to know, Rich. I, I've, I started because, you know, the thing is, what's really interesting to me is that, you know, the first show in New York City and really the first comic show in, the, in New York City or even in uh, Europe, I, I think it was in London, they always called them the comic art convention. And I, I just really like the fact that, you know, the, the comic arts, you know, is considered an art medium. And, uh, you know, early on, I mean, we kind of lost it with all the 
you know, Wizards and all these other shows and everything. But I, I appreciate the fact that um, the shows and the concepts, that, you know, they early on they were looking at the, the whole medium as an art form. And I, you know, I, and I, and so when I read that, you know, that that his gallery was, you know, the, was called uh, the Comic Arts Gallery. And if you look at the old pictures of Super Snipes in front of their store, they list, uh, you know, comic art for sale and they, they really kind of promote it as an art medium. So uh, I, I'm going to have to look for one of those copies too. I, I checked eBay earlier today and I didn't find any. The only thing I could find were old copies of the show programs to the, to the uh, comic art conventions, uh, you know, from like 1970 to 1982. Um, so, you know, but I'll probably pick those up too. I, I don't have any of them and it would be nice to have a couple of those. So, uh, let me just hop into the uh, popular picks for the week and we can get things wrapped up. Um, let's see. So again, this is from the 30th through December 6th. This first piece is by Art Adams. It's Phoenix Resurrection cover in the collection of Dino Mauricio. Art Adams, of course. Next up is a artwork by Matteo Scalera in the collection of Eduardo N. This is uh, Batman White Knight, issue one splash page. Yeah, this one's absolutely beautiful. I, I love Mateo's work. Uh, and this, as I had foretold, was a piece in Anker's collection. It's of course, Mark Brooks from the Giant Size X-Men tribute. Uh, it's a beautiful color piece. As he said, Cochran would be proud of that. And uh, this is from Khalil's gallery. This is from Iron Man 244 by Bob Layton, just a really great Iron Man interior page. Next up is from the collection of Nick Catratus, Sal Buscema, John Verporten, uh, so it was Captain America 157, page 30. And we haven't, we haven't featured many pieces from Sal, I need to correct that, I, I can't see how he hasn't been in at least every other week. Uh, this is from Ruben Duck Collector's collection, this is uh, Grummet and Hampshire, it's from X-Men Forever, number three. This is a Why the Last Man painted cover uh, from the collection of Alan Hamilton. It's artist Massimo Carnival. And uh, these, this piece, and there could have been two, L.B. Jeffries collection posted two Conan covers uh, during this week. This is number 107 by Busema and Terry Austin. This one makes me laugh every time I see it. It's that dirty, hairy kind of thing from Mike Grell. And uh, it's from the Warlord number 33 cover, collection of Joe Schaefer. I love it. Very classic. I mean, I remember seeing that on the newsstands when we picked them up. And this is uh, Don Rosa, of course. This is Screw McDuck, A Letter from Home cover in the collection of Monty B. Next up is this Bruce Tim piece. And I actually picked up a Bruce Tim piece myself, which I hope to have in my calf gallery in a few weeks. This is in the collection of AMR1. This is the back cover to Bella Lugosi's Tales from the Grave, number one. And this is in Paul P's gallery. It's by Mark Bagley, of course. It's a cover to the official handbook of the ultimate Marvel Universe, number one. And finally, this is, of course, Mike Diodato Jr. This is in the collection of Stephen Filosa. This is from New Avengers, Volume 2, Issue 21 cover. Just a fabulous piece. And see, I had to throw in the Dirty Harry reference because I just wanted to make sure everybody got that. I loved it. So there you go. So uh, I did tease that uh, I got something in the mail. It's funny. I wish I would have gotten it in the... Uh, uh, mailed it just yesterday before I uh, talked with Vincent because I got my annual package from Comic Connect slash Metropolis Collectible. So I'm going to open it up. See, And the thing is, when, uh, when and I've gotten these for probably like the last 10 years. I don't know why. We're not, we're not tight or anything, but I got on their list and I'm happy. As you can see, I have a couple other bottles of wine over there. So the, the fun thing is, is that Vincent always puts himself into every uh, label that goes on in the bottles of wine. So you never know what bit of comics history he's going to uh, indulge in. I um, can't really see these probably too well, but a few years ago, this was, of course, you know, the, his take on the, uh, the classic Neil Adams, uh, you know, Green Lantern, Green Arrow cover. 
he's not doing drugs, he's drinking wine. And uh, let's see, this was from, uh, I believe, uh, the X-Men 133 John Byrne cover. Of course, that's uh, Vincent as Wolverine on that one. I've, unfortunately, I think I've actually threw the other ones out. These ones I, I never drank. My wife didn't make me pop them open and drink them, so I just kind of kept them around. Let's see. Oh, well, I don't think I need to tell you. <laughs> That's funny. I don't need to tell you much about that. But there is Vincent again. He has worked himself in there as the Joker. Another classic one. Happy Holidays from Metropolis Collectibles and Comic Connect. And, of course, it says cheers. He's not holding a camera. He's holding a bottle of wine. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, not art, but just as good. So, uh, you know, I'm going to end it here, everybody. Um, you know, William, you know, saying thank you, friend us over you. Um, the tour of Metropolis was, uh, was the highlight. You know, I knew that um, I knew we were going to do an, a, a little bit of a sales pitch at the beginning of it. And uh, but, you know, Vincent has such a fantastic collection as well that I really enjoyed last night's uh, show. And I, I, I can't wait to actually be able to go to their place. I didn't get I've never got to see their their old offices, which is why he and I joked. That was one of the first questions I asked him uh, when we were talking about doing the interview was if they still had you know, the artwork hanging in the bathrooms, because that was always the joke. People would go to the, the lavatory and see half a million dollars of artwork hanging in the men's room. And uh, apparently, for whatever reason, they decided that it probably wasn't a wise idea. So when they changed offices, there is no artwork hanging in the bathroom. So uh, it's probably a smart move for them. But but it was still pretty crazy to see all that artwork and to see those, uh, like the rights and, you know, uh, first Swamp Thing cover tucked away, you know, in, a, in, in, in between stacks of comic books and whatever else they had laying around there. So um, it still looked like they were sort of moving in, but it probably always looks like that, you know, with all the merchandise coming and going there. So, but again, that was really fun. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, hopefully I can make it out there, but we'll probably do something else with them. We, you know, maybe I'll get lucky and uh, I can get Steve on for a interview sometime. Um, we'll see, we'll see, we'll definitely see. So um, like I said, I've got my interview to do tomorrow. So I've got a lot of prep work for that. And if anybody wants to tune in on Sunday, it'll be noon Eastern and we'll be chatting with Anthony and you know, he'll be like the man on the floor, probably talking with a few other um, collectors. And like I said, we'll be doing uh, smart sales for him. So just something trying to fill the void guys until uh, we can have some conventions again. It might be you know another year. So we might as well try to try to find things that work and make us all happy and give us a little bit of enjoyment. So uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. And I look forward to doing the next one. Oh, and I should let you know, the uh, really important uh, Comic Art Live chat on Tuesday. Um, we've been chatting about potentially doing one of these for a while. And uh, sorry, I've just got too many things here on my table. But um, on Tuesday, we are going to have uh, Michael Lovitz. And uh, that'll be at 9 p.m. Eastern. That'll be with the whole crew, Mike Berkey, Glenn Brunswick, and Will Gabrielle. And then on Thursday, I've got uh, Travis Ellisor and uh, Joshua McCoy two really big commission collectors. And so we're going to be talking, you know, what's their motivation behind the themes that they've got on, on Thursday. And of course, when we're on the Tuesday chat with, uh, with Michael Lovitz, uh, he's probably the biggest George Perez collector that's out there. So we're going to be looking a lot at a lot of Perez artwork and uh, he's been in the hobby for a long time. He's uh, he's an attorney. He's, he's done a lot of uh, certain you know, representation within the hobby for different issues. And so it should be a really fun chat. I hope everybody definitely tunes into that. I'm going to get those uh, shows set up tomorrow so that people can bookmark them. And I, I, I hope you tune in to, uh, to those as well, because they're going to be a lot of fun. So again, thanks. Have a great Friday evening. And I appreciate you tuning in.